we will start with Pritcher Herman, and he's currently working in the Interactive Visualization Lab in Waterloo, Canada. Uh, and usually he's creating interfaces to bridge the gap between art and science. However, he's also looking at data physicalization and uh, how you can use tangibles to interact with that data. So are you there, Bridger? Here I am. Hello. All right. So please go ahead. All righty. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, I guess good evening or where, uh, whatever time it is where you're joining from. Uh, I'm Bridger Herman. My pronouns are he, him, and his. Today, I'd like to discuss multi-touch querying on data physicalizations in immersive AR, which is a novel approach to hybrid uh, virtual and physical visualization. Let me begin with an introduction to why uh, to physicalization itself and why it's important. One of the key ideas behind physicalization is to leverage our human perceptual abilities that go beyond the visual and into the tactile. It allows us to depict even more data than traditional visualization uh, by using the material properties of these physical objects. Physicalizations engage our senses and make huge steps toward making data approachable, such as putting our data in a museum or even uh, allowing individuals to participate by placing physical tokens. Can you all see my slides? Okay, I, I just can't see the screen share, so I'm just making sure. Uh, already. So um, yeah, so basically, uh, we, we can place these physical tokens, but what if the user wishes to make dynamic queries into the data to select, filter, sort, rearrange, or otherwise interactively explore their data? Augmenting physicalizations with digital content is one solution to this interactivity challenge. These so-called hybrid visualizations combine physical and digital elements into one cohesive interactive visualization. Prior work in this area indicates uh, two primary challenges and requirements for these hybrid, virtual, and physical systems. First, we've got to be able to sense input from the physical world. Interactions like pinch to zoom, touch to select, and swipe to pan. So for this, we need to have a high accuracy method to pick up a user's touch on this irregular surface and translate it into digital space and then react to it with our digital content. Also, when we move a physical object, uh, any virtual objects that are related to it should follow. And for this alignment and registration of virtual and physical spaces, we need high accuracy and low latency tracking between these two spaces. So we're obviously not the first ones uh, to encounter these challenges. So on the left, we have tangible landscape and tangible cityscape, which are two projection-based physicalizations that use a depth camera for touch input and only need to have uh, one initial alignment between this virtual and physical space. Uh, example two shows cityscapes, which also uh, qualifies as an active physicalization, which is a shape-changing display where the columns move up and down actually according to the data. Example three here shows a window-based AR physicalization of a molecule using a video camera and image markers to continuously register the virtual and physical worlds. And lastly, PlanWell also uses a continuous image-based tracking and a pen input device to select points on an immersive AR visualization. So our approach to these two challenges uh, is to sense touch through the physicalization and to register the virtual and physical world using image targets affixed to an optimized tracking base. For the remainder of this talk, I'll go into some detail on our approach for addressing these uh, requirements, and I'll demonstrate the approach as applied to exploratory visualization techniques, as well as sharing the results from a couple of evaluations. To solve our registration challenge, we use uh, the Vuforia Image Tracking Toolkit and a custom truncated pyramid, uh, truncated pyramid display. So here we can see four image targets that are tracked, their axes are shown in red, green, and blue. 
This truncated pyramid design was informed by initial latency trials of an oscillating image target. And we determined that the latency increases for each added visible target. So the tracking base makes sure that there are only one or two visible targets during the overview and details viewing of the visualization. To address this touch sensing challenge, we introduce touch through the data physicalization. So first of all, we start with the original data. And in this example, it's volumetric 3D time varying data from supercomputer simulations and remote sensing. This portion of the data includes ice, water, and terrain from the Filson Rani ice shelf in the Antarctic and contains variables like temperature, salinity, and ocean current velocity. So once we have the original data, we transform it and split it into a series of columns so that we can sense touch through the physicalization. We experimented with several different uh, prototypes here. Uh, for example, this is an early iteration of our touch sensing through the physicalization, which used two centimeter squares. But ultimately, we arrived at this final design of uh, one and a half centimeter diameter uh, hexagons, which can be seen in our final physicalization here. Once the physicalization is tiled and split, uh, then we 3D print it. And these columns are sliced in such a way that a regular FDM printer using PLA filament can print them, which is indeed what we did for our model. Once this is all said and done, uh, we place this physicalization on top of a force sensing tablet, such as the Sensil Morph. And this allows us to react to the user's touch in the digital world to actually make changes to our AR visualization. So putting it all together, we have our image, image tracking base that registers the virtual and physical worlds. Then we have the, uh, the physicalization that's been tiled and placed on top of a force sensing tablet. These together can sense the user's touch, relay them to the AR device so that the AR visualization can react accordingly. So now that we have a basis for this technical approach, let's apply it to some of the most common data exploration techniques for uh, 3D spatial data. In the first technique, we have uh, a cutting plane into volumetric data, which is defined by a user's two touch points and the up vector pointing out of the physicalization. In practice, the user can touch uh, two points and a white preview plane appears and once the fingers are released, the actual query is made into the data. If the user wants to move around the plane before, like if it's not quite in the right place, they can just move their fingers around and then release when it's in the right place. We also implemented a stream rake for analyzing vector fields. The stream rake takes a user's touch point and the up vector and seeds streamlines along this line and advex them uh, along, along that vector field. In practice, the user can touch points on the physicalization to see the streamlines, and we can see the, the uh, preview is shown as a little white stick. Uh, if the user wants to pick different points along the streamline, all they need to do is just move their finger and then, uh, and then release when they found a point that's interesting to them on the physicalization. To partially overcome the limitations of a small physical model, we have also implemented a physicalization as a world in miniature. This not only allows multi-scale views of the data, but enables a user to have the physicalization as a haptic proxy for the much larger AR visualization. It's also important to note that the physicalization does actually correctly occlude the virtual visualization. In particular, notice the peaks along the right here. Uh, the cutting plane will disappear behind them and then reappear on the other side uh, of the actual physical object. So what about the evaluation? We compared user touch accuracy with and without the tiled physicalization present. 
After informed consent, we ask each of our eight participants to touch a sequence of 30 dots on each of the physicalization and the bare force sensing tablet. We found that the Euclidean distance from the ground truth points uh, for both of these conditions was just over three millimeters and a Wilcoxon signed rank test was unable to find a significant difference between the two conditions. So the difference in error in these conditions is really subtle enough that we need a much larger sample size here to detect a significant difference. We also asked a climate scientist studying ocean currents underneath the Antarctic ice sheets to use our system. And as he was using it, he remarked that uh, this, like the, the physical model really grounded him when he was working with the AR visualization. And he also thought that having a system like this with the physical context would be really important for his work with other scientists to have a common physical reference frame as they're working together on the data. He also had some suggestions for us, such as having a much larger scale model uh, of the physicalization would be a lot more helpful than the small one. And also, uh, actually depicting more data on the physicalization itself would have been helpful, such as including the grounding line where the terrain, the water, and the ice meet. Uh, that would have been super helpful to include on the actual physicalization itself. So despite uh, positive results from both of our preliminary evaluations, there are still some limitations to our approach. Firstly, the print size is limiting. We, we are only able to sense the forces, uh, like the touches um, in a 24, uh, 24 by 13.8 centimeter area, which, uh, which definitely limits the size of the print that you can sense touch on here. The print time may also be limiting in some uh, workflows, such as this Antarctic print that we've been using as an example throughout the rest of the talk. Uh, it was only six centimeters tall, but it took about two days to print at a high resolution layer height of 0.15 millimeters. And also touch through the physicalization works best for convex geometries that can be adapted to have a flat bottom which doesn't necessarily apply to every data set. It works really well in cases like terrain, but if you had, say, something inside of a sphere, uh, it may not necessarily work so well. During our scientist interview, the physicalization was used both as a uh, querying mechanism and a contextual piece. So this brings questions to mind like, what role does the physicalization play in the hybrid uh, virtual and physical data analysis? And how much data do we encode in the physicalization versus how much do we leave to the digital visualization that's overlaid on it? Our approach also has implications for adapting new querying techniques that use pressure or even the tactile context of the data, such as whether the touch is in a peak or in a valley or within a particular volume. So in summary, we set out with this lofty goal of fusing the interactive querying, animation, and data exploration techniques of digital visualization with the immediate and relatable tangibility of data physicalizations. But even with modern input technologies and immersive displays, combining these two things is still a hard problem. Through our process, we found that the approach of touch through physicalizations is viable as an input mechanism for hybrid visualizations. But we also need to continue to design for the future of hybrid virtual and physical visualization, including adapting current visualization software to a tangible context and continuing to develop hybrid visualizations that lead to greater clarity and communication of our data. I'd just like to acknowledge uh, my, co -author, my co authors, in particular, Max Omdahl, who was super instrumental in getting this whole thing working, and my funding from the National Science Foundation and the E3SM project for the data. And I'd also like to thank all of you for being here. Any questions? All right, I hope you could hear the applause. 
Um, thank you for the real nice um, presentation, also for showing the props, because you can be here, but now we still can get a feeling for it, how it actually feels and behaves like. Um, and I will also ask the chat to give us some questions, if there are any, and of course the people here in the room as well. But I would start with one. Um, if you would have tasked me to build something like that, I would probably have used a Kinect or Leap Motion or any depth camera of some sort. So why did you choose your uh, approach? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Uh, so one of, one of the reasons why we chose to go this route instead of using a Kinect is because of the, the limited resolution, especially on uh, like the limited depth resolution of these of these depth cameras. Uh, so you never know exactly when you're touching, uh, uh, touching the physicalization, especially with complex geometries like this. Uh, so in, in our case, it's actually physically sensing the force that you're touching. Uh, so it's, it's a lot more, uh, a lot more direct, I guess, and less, less false positives for your touches. All right, thank you. Are there any questions? Hi, Bridger. Thank you for the presentation. Cool stuff. Um, but as you said yourself, you know, combining a digital visualization with a, a physical visualization is a challenge. And I was wondering if you could speak to about some of the challenges of, of scaling this. And, and if you know what I mean by scaling, I mean, today I'm looking at one ground section of Antarctica, but tomorrow I want to look at another one. Uh, what technologies would you use to, to make this more, more scalable? Yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent question. So by scalability, I'm assuming you're referring to like this print, print time and uh, yes, yes. iteration. Yes. And stuff. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Are there any, are there any technologies that you would uh, apply to, to make it scalable? Yeah. So one of one of the trade offs that we always deal with in creating these uh, physicalizations from digital fabrication is resolution versus time it takes to create. Uh, so actually, in our conversation with the the climate scientist. He, he said that it actually would have been acceptable to have a much lower resolution version of this physical object, because he mostly used that for context as he, was, uh, as he was working with it. So we can maybe even say laser cut a series of slices to put on top of each other, and that would be much faster than uh, 3D printing something at a super high resolution. And that uh, laser cutting also would solve the problem Partially, I suppose, uh, solve the problem of like the print size because uh, of the limitations of the, the print bed on the 3D printer. Right. So, so you would incorporate the whole printing process uh, into the workflow. I mean, you see that as part of the process also in the future? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Okay. Is there another question? All right, Bridget, then once again, thank you for the presentation and hopefully next time we can have you in person and try out as a demo. <laughs>